we're joined today by Dr. Dr. Steve Dubois, and Steve is the, an associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. He's also the director of experimental therapeutics at Dana Farber and Boston Children's Cancer and Blood Disorder Center, where he leads the program designed to bring new targeted therapies to children with cancer. Um, Dr. Du Bois leads an, an active clinical trial and trans, transformational research program focused on patients, uh, many with advanced neuroblastoma and Ewing sarcoma. Um, he also studies new biomarkers that, that improve our understanding of the biology of pediatric solid tumors and of the pharmacodynamic effect of targeted therapies. Um, in addition to being um, on, on a, com a COG committee, the Neuroblastoma Steering Committee at COG, Bone Tumor Committee, Developmental Therapeutics Committee at COG. I'm happy to say he's also one of Alex's longtime uh, scientific advisory board members. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Du Bois. Uh, take it away. Perfect. Thanks so much for that kind introduction, Jay, and um, to all of Alex's for inviting me to give this um, give this. Um, talk as part of the speaker series. It's really been terrific to see all of the really exciting um, speakers who have preceded me. So this is a little bit of a different talk um, and a little bit of a departure for me. Um, most of most of the the time when I'm invited to give give a talk, I'm talking about neuroblastoma or about Ewing sarcoma or giving results of clinical trials that I've led. But in this sort of stage in my career, I've started to sort of think critically about how we get novel agents to children who need them. And, um, and so I'll share some of some of what we've been studying in this in this regard. These are my disclosures. And of course, um, I'll be discussing experimental and off label agents. That's, that's a large part of what I do on a day to day basis. So really what I'll cover in the first part of the talk is um, an overview of how children with cancer access novel therapies. And then in the second part of the talk, um, give an overview of what we're doing today to try to accelerate access to novel therapies for our patients. And when I think about access to new drugs, I really think about this four-legged stool of how um, how, as a, a, a treating oncologist, I might be able to access one of these agents for my patients. So, um, of course, there's on-label prescription um, of a marketed drug or off-label prescription of a marketed drug. Um, and then, uh, obviously, in pediatric oncology, we have a long, rich history of conducting clinical trials, um, both to answer a scientific question, but, but also that provides access to new therapies for our patients. And then there's, of course, the single patient IND mechanism when, um, when none of the other options um, pertain to a patient. And so, of course, these top two um, mechanisms are for marketed products. And in general, the, the um, bottom two options are for unapproved products, although we do do a lot of clinical trials um, that, that um, uh, are studying marketed products as well. So in terms of on-label prescription, we, I think all in the pediatric oncology community understand that there's a real paucity of um, initial FDA approvals that include children. And so we conducted an analysis with a very talented medical student that um, looked at a, a, a 20 year period from 1997 to 2017 and evaluated 117 non-hormonal drugs that were first approved by the FDA during that time period. And of those 117 drugs, only six or 5.1% 5 5 had an initial approval that included children. And so those drugs are listed here. And what's noteworthy about these drugs are that five of the six um, were approved with an ALL indication, which is, of course, the most common pediatric cancer and is a disease that is also seen in adults. And the sixth is denutuximab, which is indicated for children with neuroblastoma and is our most common pediatric solid cancer. So um, really highlighting the, the tremendous difficulties getting an initial approval 
in much less common pediatric cancers aside from ALL and neuroblastoma. Reassuringly though, since we completed that analysis in 2017, I'm aware of at least nine additional approvals post 2017. So we had over a 20 year span, only six drugs with an initial approval that included children. And now I'm aware of nine post 2017, which is really a nice, um, um, a nice trajectory and one that I hope will, will continue. Well, that's um, initial FDA approval, what about subsequent approvals and also information available on the FDA label? So this was an analysis that I um, participated in together with, um, with um, Florence Bourgeois at Boston Children's, and she evaluated a 10-year period, 2007 to 2017, and evaluated 78 cancer drugs that were approved um, uh, during, that, during that period. And only eight drugs or 10.3% had a pediatric indication either on the initial label or on the updated label. Um, so that's, that's really a problem. 90% of the drugs that are FDA approved don't have, don't have any um, uh, pediatric indication. Um, she further looked at um, whether there's any pediatric information in the label, even if the drug is not, doesn't have a label indication for a pediatric condition. Is there any information for prescribers about how to use these medicines in, in children? And 17 of these 78 cancer drugs or 21.8% had any information um, about pediatric use in the label. When that information was added, it was added at a median of 1.5 years following initial adult approval. So I think in terms of the on-label on prescribing, there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of label indications and there's not a lot of label information. So of course, we're living in an era in which there's a tremendous explosion of novel targeted therapies that are now commercially available and indicated for other, um, uh, other indications, almost always adult indications. And so we were interested in the prescribing patterns at our, at our center. So we completed a single center analysis looking at off-label prescribing of novel targeted therapies and evaluated that from 2007 to 2017. And if you just look in this figure now published in Cancer Medicine at the green bars, you can see a real uptick in um, the proportion of patients that were treated at our center with an off-label targeted therapy. And whether this is due to um, greater availability of these agents um, or greater availability of molecular profiling or both, I, I think remains, remains to be seen, but those were sort of both of our, our main hypotheses about, about why we're seeing such, a, such an uptick in off-label prescribing over time. So what about clinical trials? Well, here we understand that prior regulations, both in the United States and Europe, limited requirements for pediatric trials. And so a couple of analyses have really highlighted some of the issues with, with some of these prior regulations. So in the US, that same analysis of 78 approved drugs from 2007 to 2017 showed that all 78 approved drugs were exempted from pediatric trials. 52 because the adult indication had adult orphan status, and 26 were granted what is called a histology-based waiver, meaning that um, if, if um, a histology um, that was being, for, for which a drug was being developed did not um, occur in children at any real frequency, then the sponsor could, um, could apply for and be granted a histology-based waiver. So this unfortunately wasn't just a problem for us in the United States, but a very similar pattern in um, the European Union, where over a three-year period, 147 waivers to pediatric cancer uh, drug development were issued by the EMA. So this um, uh, obviously posed a, a, a real challenge for the field. And what this ultimately has led to is 
what, what I view as really an unacceptable lag time from the first in human clinical trial to a first in child clinical trial. So this is a swimmer's plot where each line is not a patient, which is how we're accustomed to thinking about swimmer's plots, but each line is an FDA approved oncology drug. So this is that same time period, 1997 to 2017. And these are all medicines. These are these all have quote unquote won the game and have crossed the finish line as FDA approved drugs. These are not these are not drugs that have um, died earlier in their development either due to toxicity or lack of efficacy, but these are real medicines. And so that same medical student cataloged the time from first in human clinical trial to first in child. And you can see the results here with a median of 6.5 years, which I, I, again, I think is, is unacceptably long. We also benchmark this not to the time from first in human clinical trial, but time of FDA approval, understanding that all 117 drugs are FDA approved drugs. And what we showed when we benchmarked this to time of FDA approval is that basically right before the drug is FDA approved are people starting to work on um, or starting to, to launch the, the pediatric um, first in child clinical trial. So with a median of mi minus 0 0.66 years benchmarked again from the, the date of initial FDA approval. We also looked at this trend um, by, um, by year of initial approval in this panel on the left. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but this panel on the left. And unfortunately, that, um, that metric, uh, again, looking, um, looking uh, benchmarking to year of initial FDA approval, you can see it's pretty flat from um, 1997 to 2017. We also looked at the drug class and showed very similar data um, for small molecules, antibodies, cytotoxic agents, or other, other therapies. And then we looked at the indication, whether the lead adult indication was for a solid tumor, a hematologic malignancy, or a central nervous system tumor, and, and really saw very, um, uh, a very similar finding. So this really, I think, highlights visually a real challenge faced that faced um, uh, by by our field trying to get novel agents to children more expeditiously. In a follow-on analysis, we were interested in understanding who's sponsoring these clinical trials, um, these pediatric cancer clinical trials. So we used data available from um, clinicaltrials.gov and evaluated in the panel on the left, non-oncology trials. And um, you can see here in this bar, bar chart, industry-sponsored trials are black, non-industry trials are blue, so that would include academic trials, CTEP sponsored trials, for, for example, or foundation sponsored trials. And what you can see in the panel on the left for non-oncology trials is that the pediatric trials, those under 18 years of age, have a little bit of a fall off in the proportion of trials that are sponsored by industry. But when you look at the oncology trials, you see a much more noticeable fall off in the proportion of um, oncology trials um, for children that are sponsored by, by industry. And you might ask, well, why does it matter as long as the clinical trial gets, gets done? Um, what we showed in the, in the paper was that um, the industry-sponsored trials were able to accrue more patients and were able to accrue more um, accrue more quickly compared to non-industry trials. So if the if the goal is ultimately to ask and answer a question in, in these clinical trials, it seems as though the industry sponsored trials have an advantage in that that regard. And we're seeing fewer of those um, at, at the time we did this analysis in pediatric oncology. When we think about the types of clinical trials that that um, are um, ultimately getting conducted in pediatrics. One of my concerns is that we may not always be conducting the best trial for our patients. And so 
um, with a different medical student, we again use data from clinicaltrials.gov to evaluate phase one clinical trials um, that were available to children. So we looked at um, clinical trials that um, only included children, trials that included children and adolescents and young adults, and then trials that really were um, age agnostic and included um, um, patients under 18 and really no, no upper limit. And what we saw was that there was in the pediatric only clinical phase one clinical trials that um, there was a real paucity of combination trials and a lot of monotherapy phase one phase one clinical trials more than um, more than sixty percent of the the pediatric only trials were monotherapy, whereas the older the older um, you got the the um, greater proportion of combination trials, which in in general we um, you know, I think want to get to combination testing much more quickly with our, our um, pediatric trials. Um, when we look specifically at what the combinations were, um, we, we found that there was a heavy reliance on chemotherapy combinations. So this is um, a, a plot that I'll just point out the, the top um, orange represents novel novel combinations that don't include any chemotherapy and all of the other colors below that all um, include chemotherapy, some of them chemo only, some of them novel plus plus chemotherapy. And what I had thought we might see and hoped we might see was that this novel novel um, bar might increase over time, but really it, it's um, relatively relatively static. The other concern I have is about the, um, the um, type of study design when we're doing a phase one clinical trial. And I would say the most, the most common uh, dose escalation design in these phase one clinical trials is either a three plus three design or a modification of that called the rolling six design. And, and so for those who don't do clinical trials, the three plus three basically enrolls three patients, looks to see what happens, has a gap while, while the data is being analyzed. And then if, if the toxicity looks okay, escalates and that process repeats until the, um, the recommended phase two dose is, um, is determined. And so there's a couple of problems here. One is, the gap between dose levels when the data is being analyzed. And so that gap leads to a potentially you know, you know, ideal trial candidate being placed on, on a waiting list. Um, and for those who, who take care of children with cancer, particularly the diseases I'm interested in, neuroblastoma and Ewing sarcoma, patients with, with relapsed neuroblastoma and relapsed Ewing sarcoma can't really wait on a waiting list um, and, and you know because of the, the the pace of the disease. So so that's a real problem. Um, the other problem with the three plus three design uh, or the rolling six is that it assumes that there's um, that there's a, a maximum tolerated dose that that we should be escalating to to toxicity. And, and that's really a principle that's derived from chemotherapy clinical trials. But as more and more of our work is focused on novel targeted therapies and monoclonal antibodies, um, this, this principle likely um, needs to be revisited. So indeed, in that same analysis, we evaluated whether um, uh, in these phase one clinical trials, whether the design used a rule-based design like the three plus three or the rolling six, or what's now more preferred, the model-based designs or CRM uh, type designs that um, simulations generally, uh, generally favor as being more efficient. And so what, again, I had hoped we might see in this analysis was that the proportion of blue trials using model-based designs might be increasing, but, um, but sadly that was not, not the case. And there's a heavy reliance on these rule-based designs. So 
Um, the last mechanism of accessing novel agents is, of course, the single patient IND. So this is if there's, there's no clinical trial, there's no marketed product, but there's still a strong rationale to treat an individual patient, then we have the potential to apply to the FDA and obviously work with the, with the drug company for this non-marketed product to try to access this for, our, for the individual patient. And so we looked at our practice together with Dave Schulman, one of our um, uh, one of our instructors, and um, uh, and showed again a, a fairly steady increase in the number of single patient INDs used at our institution over um, in this case an eleven year period. Um, what's interesting about these 56 single patient INDs is that they were all approved by the FDA and they're all approved very quickly with a, um, a median of one day to get FDA approval for, um, for these, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. And then as someone who conducts clinical trials, um, I was interested to see that in 65% of these uh, single patient INDs. The, the reason that a single patient IND was needed was that a pediatric clinical trial was not available. So, um, so we really have a, a, a real challenge trying to increase the number of clinical trials available to our patients. These are important mechanisms of accessing novel agents for our patients. And we've, we've shown now that there's real potential for benefit for our patients. So we pulled the data I just showed um, together with some other large pediatric centers and looked specifically at the single patient INDs that were genomically informed. And um, so in this, um, in this cohort of 45 single patient INDs requested based on genomic data, we, um, we showed that more than 30% of patients have um, have an objective response, which is pretty um, uh, pretty remarkable. We um, subsequently had a really interesting patient at, at our center, not included in that in that analysis. Um, this was a, a, a patient treated by June Kamihara at our center from the Cancer Predisposition Program. This is a patient with the Pasak Zhuang syndrome that's characterized by an activating mutation in um, in HIF two alpha. And this patient had progressive paraganglioma. And so there were, um, as a tumor marker, normetanephrines and chromogranin A. You can see that, that those tumor markers were um, uh, steadily increasing. And then um, we treated the patient with a selective um, HIF2 alpha inhibitor, belzutifan, um, that's now FDA approved, but this was pre-approval and showed really marked dramatic decrease in, um, in those tumor markers. That syndrome is associated with significant polycythemia and um, elevated um, EPO levels. And likewise, immediately after starting drug, the hemoglobin level fell to a more normal level and the EPO level um, uh, also um, fell to a more normal level. So really this patient's now been on, on drug for years with, with well-controlled disease and, and tolerating things well. So this mechanism can, can really be quite impactful for our patients. So that's, that's sort of a look at the, at the past. And what I'd like to do now is share some of what we're doing today to try to get novel therapies to children more quickly. And so some of the things that are, um, that are happening in the field are highlighted here, including lowering the age of eligibility, improving our clinical trial designs, studying sociodemographic barriers to individual patient access to novel therapies, and then of course the RACE Act, which has really changed the field. So in terms of expanding the age of eligibility, there have been now um, at least three position papers published that all argued the same thing, that, that adolescents with AYA diseases should, um, should um, be included in, um, in initial clinical trials when the biology makes, makes sense to, um, to include these, these patients. And so this is now a guidance for industry that, that says just that, that when the, when the um, biology and the disease makes sense, um, that adolescent patients 
um, should be considered for inclusion in quote unquote uh, adult oncology clinical trials. So this usually means children who are over 12 and over, over 40 kilograms can be included in some fashion in the, um, in the initial adult clinical trials, often not at the very first dose levels, but, um, but as a component um, of, of these initial adult oncology clinical trials. And so as someone who um, in part studies Ewing sarcoma, this is outstanding and I think an excellent regulatory advance for my pediatric patients who have a very typical AYA cancer. And in fact, we um, are participating in a, in a first in human study of an LSD1 inhibitor specifically for Ewing sarcoma. And that, that trial starts at age 12 years, which is really terrific. As someone who studies neuroblastoma, though, this is really a, a, a potential cause for concern. And I think we, you know, we, we need to, um, to monitor to make sure that our younger pediatric patients with diseases like neuroblastoma are still being included in, in pediatric development plans, since, since obviously they, they, those patients, those are, are not uh, are a, a typical AYA cancer. In terms of improving clinical trial designs, I think it's important to, to step back and really think about when do we really need to push the dose of, of an agent and when do we really think about doing a dose confirmation study. So I sort of, when I think about this for an individual agent, I think about whether the agent is a quote unquote MTD agent, a maximum tolerated dose agent, where really you can define a, a top dose based on toxicity. So a drug where there's clear dose toxicity relationship or a drug where there's dose limiting toxicities um, uh, seen or rare but life-threatening toxicities, or a unique juvenile toxicity concern that maybe has emerged from some of the preclinical non-human testing. Um, and so in those, in those examples, in general, it makes sense to dose with a safety margin, so dose below the adult equivalent dose initially, and try to escalate, obviously, carefully. Then more and more, we're seeing what I call the RP2D agents, so recommended phase two dose agents, where the adult dose is really based potentially more on a PK endpoint, a pharmacodynamic endpoint, a response-based endpoint, and there's, a, there's less of a clear relationship between the dose of the drug and, and the toxicity. So certainly some of the monoclonal antibodies fall into this, uh, into this category. And for these, in general, um, uh, you know, I, I like to start thinking about the initial dose cohort in pediatrics being based on 100% of the adult equivalent dose, obviously scaled to size of the patient. So I think the benefit of, of doing that is that, that fewer patients end up treated on, on lower dose levels, and you can arrive at the recommended pediatric dose more quickly and then move, on, move into the next phase of, of development of that agent in pediatrics. More and more as well, I think it's important to acknowledge our responder hypothesis in our clinical trial design. So we, we come to these clinical trials with, with some expectation of, of who we think is most likely to respond, either based on histology or increasingly based on genomics. And so um, we, we now, of course, have dedicated precision oncology clinical trials that include basket trials and umbrella trials. But more and more as well, we're able to start asking some precision oncology questions within the context of a phase one by having either expansion cohorts or um, what I call backfill, um, backfill slots for these, um, uh, for these um, uh, specific histologies or specific genomic features. And so I'll highlight just one design that Wendy London and her colleagues have, have developed. And I'll point out that this is supported by, the, by, by Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. And so she calls this the target CRM design. And I'll take you through how, how this works. So first of all, it's not a rule-based design. It's a model-based design that uses all of the data from the patients accumulated over time to recommend a dose, um, uh, recommend a dose for, for the agent. 
And so the way this works is that at dose level one, three patients enroll, we evaluate the, um, uh, oh, sorry, three patients enroll, all with unselected um, uh, histologies or, or genomic features. And then while those patients are being evaluated, a patient presents with the biomarker of maybe tremendous interest. Um, let's call it MIGAN amplification. And so those are shown in, in red. And so under a three plus three design, that patient would end up on a waiting list. And instead in the target CRM, they're allowed to enroll one dose level behind the, the dose level being evaluated. And we're able to then um, learn from that, that patient while the patient also obviously accesses this novel agent more quickly rather than being on a waiting list. So once we've completed evaluation of all three patients, we run our model and that tells us whether to go up or down on the, on the dose level. In this case with no toxicities, the red dots are the dose limiting toxicities. Then we have um, with no toxicities, we're able to escalate and you, we enroll three more patients. One of them happens to be biomarker selected and they enroll at the current, at the current dose level, in this case, dose level two. Here, a patient has a dose limiting toxicity in the first cycle. So we run our model, tells us to go down and this process repeats. And so we're able to get another backfill patient here who's able to join the study um, and not, not be on a waiting list. So we've now incorporated this, um, this target CRM model into, um, into three uh, clinical trials, investigator-initiated trials at, at Dana-Farber, and are really pleased with how this, is, how this has been performing. And Wendy's even developing an app to, um, to try to uh, make it easier for people to adopt these model-based designs for their own clinical trials. So... The other important feature that I, th I think we need to discuss when, I, when I've been talking about access, I've really been talking about access for the pediatric oncology community as a whole to be able to access these novel targeted therapies more quickly and get them into clinical trials and ultimately FDA approved and, and um, you know, broader access for, for all of our patients. It's important to just acknowledge though that there are sociodemographic barriers for an individual patient, not for the community at large, but for an individual patient to try to access one of these, um, one of these novel therapies. And so I don't have completed data at this point to, to share, but just to let you know um, uh, two things that, that I'm involved with in, um, in this area. One is an institutional retrospective review of our Dana-Farber pediatric phase one trials over the last 10 years. So we've got now over 200 patients in our, in our cohort. And we had um, this past summer, a post student, which is the, the Alex's um, medical student grant mechanism. Um, so we have um, a, a post student who's making her way through all of these, all of these records to try to understand um, what are the, the sociodemographic features of the patients who are participating in our early phase trials, and as well to look at some of the outcomes from, from those, those trials. And then together with um, Dr. Kira Bona and Lena Weinstone, um, we're looking within the context of our ongoing COG trial, ANBL 1531, which is our frontline high-risk neuroblastoma trial focused on I-131 MIBG therapy. We're looking at what is called HMH, household material hardship, and the impact of household material hardship on access to MIBG therapy. So this is, this is a really specialized therapy um, for which patients often have to travel. Um, and so um, we're trying to understand um, uh, in the context of this clinical trial, um, uh, what some of those barriers are. And there's a tremendous, a tremendous interest in this, this line of investigation um, for other novel targeted therapies. But those, that's just two of the things that I'm, I've been involved in most recently. And then I'll end with the, with the RACE Act. And so this is something that's really been a game changer, I think. Um, it's a component of the FDA Reauthorization Act of 2017, and it allows the FDA to mandate pediatric 
evaluation of oncology agents with potential relevance to pediatric malignancy. So uh, again, it allows the FDA to mandate this. It doesn't require the FDA to mandate. So there is still some, some discretion. But really the, the key advance here is that this removes the histology-based waivers um, and removes the orphan drug waivers that allowed so many prior therapies to receive waiver to pediatric development. And instead is based on science and biology and includes a list of targets that are deemed relevant to pediatric oncology that's posted by the FDA and updated over time so that um, our industry partners are, are aware of whether their targeted therapy is, is um, potentially going to, to be mandated by the FDA to undergo pediatric testing. And so just to put this in context, um, I talked earlier that, um, that of the 78 oncology drugs that were FDA approved from 2007 to 2017, none were required by the FDA to perform pediatric trials. I already shared that information with you. But under race, 61 targets would have been on the relevant list and would have been potentially um, uh, mandated by FDA to undergo pediatric testing. So this is a major shift in, in the field. And I think is, is posing some questions for the field, right? Our field needs to adapt to this new access to agents. So one of my concerns is that we, we may end up with more clinical trials, but will they be good trials and will they be important trials? So we certainly don't wanna see trials that open and never meet accrual goals. There's real ethical issues related to, um, to that. And then as well, I worry about trials of what, what's called Me Too agents, so sort of next in class or very similar to existing, existing drugs that don't have a real either efficacy advantage or um, safety advantage or quality of life, ease of administration advantage for, for our patients. So really, we, we want to move things into clinical trials that are going to really advance, um, advance the field. I do think that we'll see increased industry sponsorship, and that may help us to complete our trials more quickly, given some of the data I showed earlier in, in the talk. And I certainly hope that there will be an earlier, um, uh, earlier time to get these drugs into, into children in these first in-child clinical trials. I think as well, I'll, I'll highlight the importance of multi-stakeholder platforms like Accelerate that help to bring together industry partners, academia, um, regulatory bodies, and patient family advocates all in, in one forum to go through some of these complicated issues where maybe there's multiple agents in a class that could move into pediatric trials, but we, we recognize given the rarity of pediatric cancers that not all of those agents really should move into pediatric early phase clinical trials. So I'll end with really an idealized future state where maybe we have tons of drugs in a class that all are, are relevant to pediatric cancer. And because of the regulatory requirements now that we end up with several industry partners who are interested in pursuing a, a first in child clinical trial. And then we can all together work to figure out, okay, what's the best of this large number of drugs in a class? What's the best drug that we're then going to move into, into children? And then we'll do it quickly. So 6.5 years is right about here, but we should maybe be thinking about getting this, getting this in um, closer to the end of the first in human trial, not, not closer to FDA approval. Um, and so, ideally getting these into children much more quickly. When we do launch these trials, ideally age agnostic so that our young pediatric patients can access these agents, not just 12 and up, that we'll be evaluating these agents in combination. And if we're doing dose finding, that we'll be using model-based designs.
And then of course, in terms of the barriers, I'll give a plug to the Alex's um, patient family travel program to try to help to um, uh, reduce barriers to access to, um, to these clinical trials and ultimately to new novel therapies. So with that, I'll of course acknowledge the patients and families who participate in our clinical trials and, and often do travel from, from outside our region to, to access these trials, um, uh, the collaborators who have, have helped with this work, the trainees who have done a tremendous amount of work, including Avina, who's, who's actively working on her post project, um, the funding sources, and then this is a Zoom of, of some of my, my teammates from our experimental therapeutics um, meeting. Um, and with that, I will I will end for questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. That was that was a great talk. Um, thank you for plugging the travel for for care uh, program. For those of you on on the call, um, Alexis does have a, a program where we will help families get to clinical trials if it's away from their home hospital and. Um, we, we invest a lot of money, but you know, it's really well spent money in that program. So if you have patients that, that need to travel, but, but they can't afford it, get in touch with us and um, we can get them enrolled. Okay, a couple of questions so far. If anybody else has questions, put it into the Q&A button on the bottom of the Zoom. Um, the first question um, is from Zachariah Breckenridge. And it says, I represent a group out of Calgary, Alberta in Canada that develops CAR-T products in an academic setting. We're preparing to do a single patient study next year using our first completely in-house developed product. Our next projects will include a basket trial in a CAR for Ewing's. For these types of therapies in these rare conditions, what should our clinical research program consider as far as study designs in conduct? I think that could be a long answer, but... <laughs> that could be a long, long answer. Uh, maybe I'll just say... Um... Uh, you know, I'm certainly happy to talk offline, particularly since it's related to Ewing sarcoma, which is one of my, my two main disease interests. So I'm, I'm certainly happy to, to talk offline specifically ab about that. We do have um, a new cellular immunotherapy program that we're, we're launching here at, at Dana-Farber, and we're really excited about, about that. I, I'll just say, you know, when... Well, kudos to you for thinking about rare pediatric diseases. So, so thank you um, for for the work and for the question. Um, what what I would encourage for um, moving into a rare pediatric cancer is to engage the academic community early. Um, you know, th these will these these trials will have to be done not in the community but but at large academic academic centers that, that see a fair number of, of these patients with, with rare diseases. So um, increasingly we're having to think about, um, we're having to think about working um, either with our, our network. So Alex's supports um, multiple centers of excellence for early phase clinical trials. So we've, we've done a number of early phase trials within that network, but also working with the cooperative groups. So the children's oncology group, or disease specific consortia. So in neuroblastoma, we work very closely with the, the newer approaches to neuroblastoma therapy consortium or the NAND. For sarcoma, there's SARC. So there are a number of, of um, a number of potential venues for conducting some of these early phase clinical trials. In terms of the design, that that's I, I probably would just need to talk with you offline more about that. Oh, you're muted, Jay. Every meeting I do it at least once. Mm. Um, so the next couple of questions I think came in from Liz. So the first one says, are we taking any steps toward, toward the idealized future state as a community? I, th I think we are. I mean, I, I'd like to think that, you know, what are the, the components of that, right? I think it's, it's getting everyone in the room and deciding on the best drug. So I think the you know, Accelerate sponsors these strategy forums that, that focus on a specific class of drugs or a specific target and really helps to prioritize and, and helps to sort through some of that so that really the things that, that the, the community thinks 
are going to be most impactful for children get to children more quickly. So I think that part of things um, it, it has has been really um, fantastic to to be involved in some of those those strategy meetings. In terms of getting things into into children before the six point five year mark, I really do think race is helping with that. I think the the um, you know number of of calls and meetings with with pharma has has really increased, um, and I think. Um, pharma is having to start to th having to think about pediatric drug development much earlier in in the process. So I, I think we're we're making progress because of because of race. And then in terms of doing good trials, once once we get access to the agent and are are cleared to move forward with a a, a clinical trial, you know, I, I I'd like to think that. Um, more people will be adopting these model-based designs and, and quite honestly, doing less dose finding and doing more dose confirmation. Most of the time when we define a pediatric dose, it's very similar to the, to the adult dose. And so we, we you know, should be able to confirm the dose and then move, move to the next question of, of is, is the drug worth further study in a broader broader group of, of pediatric patients. So a couple of things I wanted to bring up and see if you have any opinion on ways that we can, can fix this. One would be a, a scenario where there's a patient at, I would say, um, a hospital that's far away from a major center. And they're told there's, there's no more treatment options. But there are treatment options if, if the family traveled. Is there a way that we could better educate doctors that may be at smaller centers that aren't aware always of what trials are going on? Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Um, you know, there's, there's ct.gov, clinicaltrials.gov, which is, you know, big and complicated and you know, we're supposed to keep those records up to date. We try really hard to keep them up to date, but sometimes, you know, sometimes, you know, even for for us for a phase one clinical trial, it may be that the the trial is categorized as categorized as recruiting, but at that exact moment there might not be a slot or something like that. We're trying to get away from that with again with our our target CRM design. But if the if there's not a slot ready for that that patient at that exact moment, then it's it's a little bit a little bit tricky. We also are trying, you know, we 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 need to do a better job of keeping our own institutional databases up up to date with with what's with what's available. Some large centers send out newsletters of their their clinical trial portfolios, but it's it's real information overload and you know in general the the people you know the 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 solid tumor pediatric oncologists in my region tend to just reach out and say hey i've got a you know i've got a kid with you know with relapse disease x what what might make sense for that that patient so um it it's gets very tricky i know that alex has had a, a navigator on and off over the last few years, and it's been a little bit tricky with the with the pandemic as well. But that that's um, I, I don't know what your thoughts were on 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 how useful that that has been for um, for patients and families to have have kind of that type of concierge type type matching. Yeah, I you know I think in an ideal world it, it would work, but when the pandemic happened and and people stopped traveling, it, it made it tough. The other, yeah. the, the other thing that um, I was thinking about is there's a lot of competing trials and not all drugs are equal and not all trials are equal. So how, how can we, how can we get, a, you know, accrual in, in the best trials? Yeah. And, and, and that's always something that I guess we struggle with, right? It's, it's hard. And I, am increasingly impressed with how little we know. I mean, I think when you sort of go in suspecting something is going to be better that, but, or that something's not going to be so good. So, you know, the, the, I, I, I ran a randomized trial of, of three different MIBG regimens 
And going in, I said, oh, I'm sure this arm is going to be the winning arm. And of course it, it wasn't, right? And so this is why we do research and we, we go in with a hypothesis, but we can't presuppose the, the, the answer. We have to you know, carefully, carefully study things and, and, and get the answer. So we have one more question. Um, it says, do different trials benefit from different designs or is the adaptive trial design always better in your opinion? Um, no, I think, I think, you know, there, there are advantages of the rule-based designs. They're, they're relatively straightforward. Um, you know, you, they don't require a ton of, of infrastructure to, um, you know, to, to launch and they tend to get favorably reviewed by statistical reviewers at the IRB or the scientific review because these these are designs that have been around for decades and people are very familiar with them. Um, the problem is they're largely matched to chemotherapy, right? And we're, we're studying, I hope, less and less chemotherapy over over time, so, but I, I think there's still a, a role for them in very small clinical trials, maybe where you've just got a couple of dose levels and aren't doing a ton of dose finding. Um, so, and, and hopefully, again, as we're, as we're studying more RP2D drugs and fewer MTD drugs to use terminology from, from the talk, you know, that, that, that's where I think um, those, those, um, designs can be most most useful. You can, you know, I, I jokingly tell Wendy, who's the, the 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 PhD statistician that I work with here at Dana Farber, you just need to be able to count to six. <laughs> <laughs> she sort of hates that, but, yeah, but it's true. <laughs> I, I, I know Wendy, and I can imagine she. <laughs> All right, last question here. Can you talk for a minute about the suspected socio demographic barriers to participating in clinical trials? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a tremendously important question. I'm I'm I used to say I'm not an expert in disparities research, although I guess fundamentally the talk I just gave is about the disparity of being a child, right? Like like it's kind of a weird thing to say, but being a kid is a disparity in when it comes to cancer drug development, which is an awful scenario in which we have found ourselves, but is, I think, um, at least partially, partially true. Above and beyond that, for so that's sort of pediatric oncology. In, so disparities in within disparities. Yeah. So for an individual patient, finding their way to, to one of these clinical trials, if it's not at their inst home institution, or even if it is at their home institution, can be very, can be very, um, very challenging. I mean, there's, there's costs associated with this, there's language issues, there's, you know, sort of um, having to um, uh, uh, take time off of work to, to be in Boston for, for a time. So, um, so there are a number of, you know, very, very real concrete issues related to resources there. And then there's just being able to navigate the healthcare system which is, in, you know, in, incredibly complicated. Um, so, um, you know, I think this is an area that requires a, a lot more work. And I'm glad to see that there's, that there are dedicated people who are experts in disparities research, um, which, which I certainly can't say I am, um, who, who are shining a light on, on these incredibly important issues. All right. Last question, I promise. The yeah, other one came in. Um, where can people learn more about trial design? Are there resources how to design the best trials? Or, yeah. should, they, or should they just email Steve? No, don't do that. <laughs> email Wendy London. <laughs> what I would say is if, if that person is, a, um, is an early career investigator, so a fellow or an instructor, I, I direct people to what is called the Veil course. So this is an outstanding course put on by um, AACR, ASCO, and maybe the NCI um, who sponsored this course that is really 
it's like boot camp for clinical trials um, where you um, you go with an idea and you leave with a protocol. So it's it's got a large number of um, biostatisticians as the as the faculty, um, and that that's like a great kind of a, a great. Um, introduction. Um, more and more people who are interested in, in learning how to do clinical trials are getting specialized degrees or specialized certificates. So we have one here um, um, through the Harvard Catalyst that, that um, gives our scholars access to, um, to dedicated training in, in translational clinical and translational research. So I'm, I'm guessing that you've got some local resources that you could turn to but also um, the, the Vail course is an outstanding national resource that you could think of. Uh, somebody posted it into the chat, vailworkshop.org. So Excellent. Good. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Steve, for giving us so much enlightenment on, on, uh, on this topic. And we appreciate you and um, keep up the great work.